as you know, the important thing is to understand what you're doing rather than to get the right answer. <laughs> Here's how they do it now. You can't take three from two, two is less than three, so you look at the four in the tens place. Now that's really four tens, so you make it three tens, regroup, and you change the ten to ten ones, and you add to the two and get twelve, and you take away the three tens. Okay, this is the Math 140 final review. Uh, this will be in three parts. The first part is what we're going to do right now. It's on limits and derivatives. So let's get started. The first thing we talked about this semester was limits and how to calculate limits. Um, but let's look quickly at the graphical representation of limits and where they exist and don't exist. So limits exist at holes that would look something like that. Uh, just the hole in the middle of the graph. Limits exist there because limits don't care at what happens actually at the point. Uh, similarly, limits exist at removable discontinuities and those are the ones with a hole with a little point hovering above it. Limits don't exist at um, vertical asymptotes and we know what those look like. Um, and the other, the one that people forget is limits don't exist at infinite oscillations and these are problems that look like, oh, limit as x goes to 0 of sine 1 over x, that as x gets closer and closer to 0, the function oscillates faster and faster until it gets to that point. So the function doesn't go up to infinity, but it's also not well-behaved near 0, so the limit doesn't exist. In terms of calculating limits, we spent quite a lot of time on this. Um, these are problems that look like simply find limit as x goes to 2, and maybe there's a square root, maybe there's a fraction, something like that. And things to try, of course, the first thing you should always do is just try plugging in the variable. In this case, try plugging in 2. 9 times out of 10, you'll get 0 over 0, which just means you have more work to do. Um, most people remember that multiplying by a conjugate is always a good option. And after you do that, simplify, uh, maybe do some factoring, and cancel terms. We had lots of different approaches, lots of example problems, so I would refer you to your notes from those days for a more in-depth look at this stuff. One thing to remember is how to deal with absolute values. Let's just break this out over here. If we have some problem like limit as x goes to 3 of absolute value of x minus 3 over x minus 3. <clears throat> what you need to do is break that into two parts. So limit as x goes to 3 from the left of that problem. If, the, if x is slightly less than 3, so for example if x was 2, the thing inside the absolute value is negative. So when you write it again without the absolute value, you stick a negative sign in there then the x minus 3 terms cancel, and you just get negative 1. Similarly, you look at x goes to negative 3 from the right, uh, and this time when you drop the absolute value signs, you don't need an extra negative, and you just get 1. So if the problem was just find this limit, limit as x goes to 3 of absolute value x minus 3 over x minus 3, the answer would be that it doesn't exist, because the limit from the left and limit from the right are not equal to each other. Uh, the last thing we looked at with limits was this special case with a trig function, limit as x goes to 0 of sine x over x equals 1. And there's a long, long drawn out geometrical argument for this, but the easiest thing to do is just to memorize that. <coughs> uh, the other thing to memorize is it doesn't matter if it's sine x over x or sine 5x over 5x or sine 100x over 100x you're always going to get 1. So if you see some sine x over x term, just manipulate it until you get the same coefficient, like 5x over 5x, uh, and then replace that whole expression by 1. <coughs> we talked about minimum and maximum values, like how to find the minimum and maximum values of some 
generic function. The first thing to look at, of course, is critical numbers. And critical numbers are where f prime is equal to zero, which most people remember, but the second definition of a critical number where f prime doesn't exist, but the function exists. So let's just look at this graph we've drawn here. Um, let's circle in red the things that are critical numbers and put a little x over what's not a critical number. So critical numbers are where the slope is zero or the slope um, doesn't exist but the function exists. So those first two on the left are where the slope is equal to zero. Uh, the third one is where the slope goes to infinity but the function exists. Uh, the, the last one on the far right, the removable discontinuity, that's a critical number because the function exists but is not differentiable at that point. <coughs> uh, vertical asymptotes are not critical numbers. Holes are not critical numbers. So there's no chance for a minimum and maximum value at those points. We looked at a whole bunch of these named theorems that I know these. this gets a little monotonous, but let's try to reduce it to just a few uh, slides with short definitions. Of course, most of these, in reality, have some uh, limitations on them, on such and such interval, but I'm going to just try to summarize these as, as in as few words as possible. So the extreme value theorem said if a function is continuous, then it has to have an absolute max and min. So any generic function on an interval has an absolute max and min. Things with vertical asymptotes don't have absolute extrema because they're not continuous. Uh, Fermat's theorem was the next one. And Fermat's theorem says if you have a local extremum and the derivative exists, then the derivative is equal to zero. It's very important to remember that this doesn't work backwards. So just because derivative is equal to zero doesn't mean this is a local min or max. We looked at Rolle's theorem, um, which says if the function is differentiable on some interval, and the endpoints are equal to each other, then at some point in the middle, the derivative has to go to zero. We looked at the mean value theorem, and you can think of Rolle's theorem as a special case of the mean value theorem, but that says if f, the function is differentiable, then there must exist some point c at which f prime of c is f b over f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And you can think of this as saying the instantaneous slope at some point has to be equal to the average slope over that interval. We looked at the intermediate value theorem, which is uh, very pretty simple to understand, but a lot of people don't understand exactly what it means. Um, if you have some function that's continuous from A to B, then it has to cross any given horizontal line that's between F of A and F of B. And we call that point C. So if the function is continuous and it goes from some high point to some low point, it must cross every point in between. If it's not continuous, intermediate value theorem doesn't apply. The last one we're going to talk about is squeeze theorem, and this is one of the earlier ones in the semester, so you may have forgotten this, but the idea is if you have some function g that's bounded between two functions f and h, you're allowed to take the limit as x goes to a or as x goes to whatever you want of the whole equation, and you use squeeze theorem in cases where f and h both approach the same value l. If that's true, then you know the limit in the middle also has to go to l. And we use the squeeze theorem almost exclusively for these ones where there's some infinite oscillation term, like sine of 1 over x. 
times x, where we don't know what the sine of 1 over x is doing near 0, but we know that that x term at the, at the beginning is going to make it go to 0 near 0. Uh, we talked about derivatives, and we all have memorized the definition of derivative. Just limit as x goes to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x over h, and that gets a box around it because you will memorize it. Uh, it's important to know where a function is not differentiable. If a function is not continuous, it can't be differentiable, so it, the function is automatically not differentiable at discontinuities. Uh, corners, and the one that people forget, functions not differentiable at vertical tangent lines, and that's distinct from vertical asymptotes. So that would be something that looks, I don't know, like this, where there's a vertical tangent line um, at zero, so it's not differentiable there. If you want to get into how to draw derivatives, we talked about this a little bit. Um, if you, let's say we have some generic function that does something like that, and you want to draw the graph of the derivative f prime right below it, the first thing you do would be to, wherever there's a horizontal tangent line, that means the derivative has to go to zero, so put little zeros there. Then you can mark regions where the function is increasing and decreasing. These vertical tangent lines, like I mentioned, a vertical tangent line in the function leads to a vertical asymptote in the derivative. So here you can imagine to the left of the vertical tangent line, the slope gets very, very high and positive, and to the right, it's still very high and positive, and, but getting closer to zero. Then when you're done that, just um, connect the dots with some smooth curve, or in reality on your final exam, just pick the answer that looks closest to what you've sketched, and you should be in good shape. <coughs> We did a lot of work with differentiation, just the mechanics of it. Most of you are pretty good with this by now, but just to review what concepts you should know, product rule, of course, that's when you have two functions multiplied together. You take the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times derivative of the second. So f prime, f prime g plus f g prime. Quotient rule. Uh, f over g gives you f prime g minus f g prime over g squared, over the bottom squared. And it's important to remember the derivative of the top one comes first. So f prime g minus f g prime. Chain rule. If you have some composite function, take the derivative of the outer function, leaving the inner function alone, then multiply by the inner derivative. You also need to memorize the few trig functions we learned. Um, derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. It wouldn't hurt to memorize that the derivative of tangent is secant squared. The other trig functions, you can back out what the derivatives are using quotient rule, but it might save you a little time. The one for tangent comes up often enough that it's probably worth memorizing. Implicit derivatives, these are problems that look like some composite function with x's and y's, cosine of x squared y plus y squared equals 7, find y prime. Um, so what you want to do is take the derivative as normal, but whenever you take a derivative with a y, stick a y prime at the end. So here we've just left the x squared y prime, the inner derivative of the cosine x squared y, as a separate line, so we'll work that out in a separate step, just so we don't have to do all of everything all in one big step. So sine of x squared y, the inner derivative would be 2xy plus x squared y prime. So there's, a, there's some product rule going on here. 
plus 2y, y prime equals 0. The last step would be to solve for y prime, so you just move everything with y primes to one side, factor out a y prime, and then finally just divide to get your final answer and find the appropriate bubble. So that's it for this time. Um, next time we're going to talk a little bit about curve sketching, uh, optimization problems, related rates, and linearization. So we'll see you next time.